a particularly exciting topic because of some of the major breakthroughs that have been made in just the last couple of years. So a lot of what you're hearing today is almost real time in terms of what the state of the art is, in terms of what we can do scientifically to help people who suffer from this disease. But let's start with the key question, right? The whole point of why you're here. Are we close to a cure? And you know, as all good scientists, we always have to parse our answers very carefully uh, so as not to instill any false hope. But I think it's safe to say treatment of this disease is going to improve fairly dramatically in the next two decades, right? Things are now going in through clinical trials. A recent breakthrough just came out of clinical testing that's already going to start making a, a huge difference in the treatment of this disease for, for patients. Um, unfortunately, you know, how you define cure, it really defines, you know, how close we are to achieving one. So if, if you're talking about full reversal of the disease, if you're talking about full restoration of normal function for these patients, we still have a little ways to go, right? But within two decades, I'm fairly confident that this can happen, certainly within my lifetime. In the lifetime of our children, absolutely. Um, just the amount of uh, interest in the disease funding uh, has been moving in a direction to try to support these advances. And I think, you know, I pulled up this, uh, excuse me, this quote here at the bottom. This was from a, a recent review on some of the work I'll talk about, uh, kind of quoting Sir Winston Churchill, kind of saying right now in the field of diabetes, it is not the end or not even the beginning of the end, but the end of the beginning. And I do think that's a pretty accurate statement of where we are today. Uh, we know enough about the disease. Uh, we have enough tools at our disposal to approach the disease in novel ways to advance novel treatment strategies. So let's review the disease a little bit. Uh, so diabetes, type 1 and type 2, affects roughly 10% of the American population, right? And it's been a growing number. As you can see here on this density map, it, it is somewhat geographically focused. And about 3 million Americans, or 1% of our population, suffers a particularly intractable form of the disease, type 1 diabetes, which is what we'll talk about today. Uh, type 2 is kind of considered a little more of like a lifestyle disease. There are lots of drugs and options available to, in order to manage that disease rather effectively. Type 1, you really only have one option for treatment currently. Uh, but you know, I think you'll see from the end of this presentation that that's changing quickly. The economic cost is, is pretty substantial right, 14 to 15 billion dollars a year in the United States alone. So you can imagine what that would mean globally. So let's review just roughly the pathology of the disease, you know, kind of at a somewhat high level. Surprisingly, we still have a lot to learn about how this disease develops. But from a very basic standpoint, what we understand is there's defective production of the cells that become your immune cells. Okay, so these are cells that come out of your bone marrow and they get educated in your thymus. That education process is messed up, right? That's from a combination of both genetic factors and environmental. Genetic, we understand a little better. Environmental, we still have almost no idea. A lot of hypotheses as to what kind of environmental factors work with your genetic predispositions to essentially cause you to develop these mature immune cells that are autoreactive, meaning they attack normal tissue, okay? And in this case, the normal tissue they attack are called beta cells, right? These are the cells in your body that produce the hormone insulin, right? Insulin is critical for regulation of your blood sugar levels. It's the only hormone that allows you to kind of con lower the levels of blood sugar in your body. Without it, you're unable to do that, and you lose control of your blood sugar, right? So you constantly tend to have very high levels of blood sugar in your body, and that leads to, over the long term, a lot of complications, including cardiovascular disease, retinopathy or blindness, uh, nephropathy, kidney failure, or you've probably all heard of diabetic ulcers, which typically result in the amputation of certain lower limbs on these patients. So these things don't happen right away when you develop the disease. They, happen by accumulation over time. So typically late in life, uh, people who are type 1 diabetics suffer from a lot of these problems. 
And you know, some of the technologies we currently use to treat it, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. You know, there's the standard fingerprint prick glucose sensor, right, where you prick your finger for a little bit of blood, and then you use a little machine, a little test strip in a machine to read what your blood sugar is. Uh, of course, you have to couple that with insulin injection. So you tell, you're able to read how much blood glucose you have or blood sugar you have, and then you're able to calculate how much insulin you need to inject into your body so that you can lower it appropriately. You can't inject too much insulin. If you inject too much insulin, you go too low or hypoglycemic. That's very dangerous because you pass out. And if you pass out, that means you're unable to do anything about it, right? You have to have someone there to help you. And if no one's there to help you, you can die in that state. Um, you've also probably heard of a continuous glucose monitor. That's kind of there in the lower left-hand corner over here. And then, of course, an insulin pump, which are kind of somewhat moving the direction of automating the the standard glucose fingerprint sensor or the insulin injection in a, in a little bit of a more automated fashion. So you might think, you know, looking at these two technologies here at the bottom, you know, would you be able to kind of link these up, right, and kind of make something what's called a, a, an artificial pancreas? You may have, have heard some of this in the news very recently, right? That's basically where you're trying to close the loop between a glucose sensor and an insulin pump. Right? So suddenly you have this glucose sensor is reading your blood sugar level, and then it's telling your insulin pump exactly how much insulin to deliver. Right? So that's actually in the very last two weeks, there's been a very huge advance uh, as far as something that's come out of clinical testing for it. So improved disease management, right? This is something that's already is happening today. That's already going to make a difference in, in the lives of a lot of type 1 diabetics. Um, Autoimmune reversal is always a goal. And I think that's, you know, when a lot of scientists, you talk to them, this is a key part to the puzzle, right? If we really want to say we've cured the disease, disease management is treating symptoms, right? We're, we're treating the patient after they've already developed the disease. Autoimmune reversal is basically attacking the root cause of the problem, right? How do we deal with the fact that these patients have these immune cells that attack normal tissue? How do we reverse that? How do we change that? How do we normalize or re-educate those immune cells so that they don't behave in this uh, abhorrent manner? And then there's replacement therapy, right? So, so this is, think of like a transplantation, right? You're missing a certain organ or tissue in your body. What we've typically done in biomedical science is you, you get a heart transplant, you get a lung transplant. Right? So this is pancreas transplantation has been attempted as a form of replacement therapy. Um, there's also been big advances for new tissue development. Right? Basically, how do we grow insulin-producing tissue outside the body and then put that into the body as opposed to requiring someone to die to donate a pancreas? Uh, and then finally, islet and cell transplantation. Uh, which, you know, I'll say this is coupled with new tissue development because just because you can grow a tissue outside the body, it's not necessarily so easy to then just throw that into the body and have it work. Uh, there's something called tissue rejection, which you, you fight whenever you get any sort of organ transplant. And I'll talk about it in a little bit. It doesn't make sense for, for type 1 diabetics to do what you would normally do for other transplant recipients. So these are the three technologies I'm going to be talking about today the artificial pancreas, the and new tissue development, and uh, basically a major advance in islet or cell transplantation technology. So closing the loop, I already kind of alluded to this earlier. Just two weeks ago, Medtronic received FDA approval for use of their uh, essentially artificial pancreas device. It is two devices, a continuous glucose sensor and an insulin pump. So you can kind of see here, there's your glucose sensor, there's your insulin pump, and there's communication between those two devices, right? They talk to each other. And there's essentially an algorithm in the computer that basically calculates what the patient's actual blood glucose is and exactly how much insulin should be delivered. Sounds great. It's a version 1.0 device, right? This is not going to automatically do away with manual intervention on behalf of the diabetic, right? So it's taken over a decade of research to get this far, and this is the first device to be approved. 
Uh, so that was just September of this year. Five to eight percent improvement in blood sugar control. That may not sound like a lot, right? But to a type 1 diabetic, it's quite significant, right? It changes, improves the quality of their life. The less time they're spending having high blood sugar or too low blood sugar, you're really improving their, their quality of life. They, they report and feeling that difference of 5 to 8 percent. Like I said, it's a version 1 device, so it doesn't work for any situation. So if you have a meal, the type 1 diabetic still has to intervene. They have to calculate how many calories they're going to consume. They have to calculate how much insulin they need to inject, and they need to do that injection before they start eating their meal. Right? So that's, that's a part the technology hasn't quite figured out yet, is how to be responsive in an accurate way to a sudden acute change in a blood sugar level like that. It's functioning more on the off hours when you're not eating, right? Just making sure you have a good background level of insulin present at all times so that you don't suffer sudden spikes or drops that are usually can happen when you're not eating a meal. So it's a great step in the right direction. It's exactly where people expect it to be kind of this first breakthrough technology to start to make an impact on the lives of these patients. But version 1.0. There's some iterations that need to be done on this device to make it, you know, further useful to these, to these patients. So now let's focus on the other two technologies. I'm going to talk about these two together, right, because as, as I kind of alluded to, you kind of need the other technology to go along with the other one in order to make something that's useful for a patient. So new tissue development and transplantation. So why can't transplantation automatically solve all our problems? Well, if the alternative is not mortality, right, meaning, you know, you need a heart transplant because if you don't, you will die, right? You need a lung transplant because if you don't, you will die, right? The equation, the, the pro-con, the risk-benefit ratio becomes a little obscure, thwarted. It doesn't make sense anymore. Right? Why does that, why is that the way? Well, because when you receive a transplanted tissue, you automatically have to go on lifetime immunosuppression. That means your entire immune system has to be suppressed. Okay? Otherwise, you'll reject that new tissue that's just been put into your body. That's not a cakewalk. That's not all of a sudden everything's hunky-dory back to the way things were. You get a cut, you go to the hospital. You get a cold, you go to the hospital. And just as a bonus, you now have a higher chance to develop cancer because you don't have an immune system to fight off any of the early stages of cancer formation, right? So now if you're a type 1 diabetic, we're talking about quality of life because of the ways we have to manage the disease, not mortality, right? So for you to choose between glucose monitoring and insulin injections and lifetime immunosuppression, guess what? you're choosing disease management, right? Because you'd rather be able to have an immune system and not have to worry every time you get a cold or a cut or a scratch or anything like that and not get cancer, of course. The other major problem is donor tissue is limited, right? So three million Americans have type 1 diabetes. We do not have three million pancreases to distribute to them, right? So that's always a problem with transplantation technologies. Well, a major breakthrough was made two years ago in Doug Melton's lab at Harvard, and they basically figured out how to make mature insulin-producing human cells from human embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells. So those are kind of the more alternative to using embryonic stem cells. So either stem cell source, they figured out how you could go from that stage of differentiation for that cell all the way to a mature insulin producing cell on the bench top, right? Doesn't require an organism at all to do this. So it's great big advance for stem cell biologists. This is kind of considered one of the holy grails. And, you know, just to show a little bit of the data, all you need to kind of look at a disease is on the bottom. That's actually isolated insulin producing tissue from a human cadaver. And then on the top, these are the actual SC beta cells is what they're called in the paper. So these are the cells that are derived from stem cells that now produce insulin. All you need is look at these and they look very similar. That's kind of all you need to see from these two photos. They basically successfully were able to make these cells and they look exactly like 
the sorts of cells that you would isolate out of someone's pancreas. Now, like I alluded to, this is a great accomplishment, but it can't work alone. This solves the donor tissue problem. If you can now grow these in large bioreactors and large vats, you essentially have unlimited tissue you could give to type 1 diabetics. But if you just put this tissue into these patients, right, without immunosuppression, which you already know they don't want, right, this is what's going to happen. And this is in a diabetic mouse. These are the easiest graphs to read, right? For a mouse, you need to be below 200 to be normal. And as you can see in this graph, none of those curves go below 200, right? Regardless of where you put the cells, in the abdomen, in the kidney, or under the skin, you get no glycemic correction, no blood glucose lowering. These mice stay diabetic. Why? Because they have healthy immune systems. They're not immunosuppressed. As soon as the cells go in, they get rejected, right? So what's another way we could do this? What's, uh, what's that other technology that needs to be developed? We need a way to transplant tissue into these type 1 diabetic patients without using immunosuppression, but protect the tissue. And this is this concept of immunoisolation, right, which I think is a very intuitive one. If you can't use drugs to suppress the immune system, you know, what if you could put the transplanted tissue behind some kind of physical barrier, right, something that'll keep out the immune system but, you know, has pores in it, holes, right? Holes that are small enough to operate by this principle scientists like to call size exclusion. Basically, it just means small things can go through the pores, the things that need to go through the pores, things like glucose or sugar, insulin, right? So you need the cells to sense the glucose levels, so that needs to pass through. You need insulin to pass out in order to have an effect on the patient. But the pores need to be small enough such that factors of the immune system can't get through, can't touch the transplanted tissue. If they can't touch the tissue, they can't kill the tissue. And this is not a new concept. This is actually an idea that was formulated in late 60s, 70s, right? People tried to figure out, can we do this? Do we have tools available that could do away with immunosuppression for transplant recipients? And what, what scientists found is there's this material called alginate, right? And, and you may not even realize it, but alginate is somewhat ubiquitous in our daily lives. You've eaten it. You've probably put it on your skin because it's a component of a lot of cosmetics. Um, when you go to the dentist, some of the, th the things the dentist uses on you are made of alginate. So it's a somewhat ubiquitous, you know, all over the place and uh, say, bio what we like to say, biocompatible, meaning it doesn't seem to cause us any harm by using this, this material. And, you know, people have realized that it has this versatility to it. So, I mean, there's the structure there, but what's more important is you can isolate tons of it. It's basically produced by algae, seaweed, right? And you can basically purify it out from algae. And it has this unique property where it basically reacts with salt. And when it reacts with salt, certain types of salt, it becomes hard, right? It hardens. And that allows it to do many different things. So it's here are just uh, four examples of different biomedical technologies that use alginate because it has this special property to harden in salt, which is a very mild condition. Why is that so important for transplantation? Well, you know, if you think about protecting transplanted tissue, you can take a solution of this alginate, this polymer, this sugar polymer, and mix it with the tissue, and then basically extrude it through the tip of a needle into a bath of salt. Very simple. I could show everyone here how to do this in 30 minutes, and you'd all be pros at it. It's that easy. And this is what happens. You get these very nice little balls, spheres, marbles, if you will, that encapsulate the transplanted tissue. So the transplanted tissue is on the inside, and the matrix, the balls, if you will, the little spheres, are porous porous to the right level we need. So the holes are small enough to allow glucose and insulin to pass through it uh, and keep out any large things like cells, antibodies, things that are part of the immune system. So this was done decades ago that we had this. What happened, right? Why, why, isn't, why aren't we putting this into all type 1 diabetics, right? At least with the quantity of donor tissue that we had available. 
Well, this is what happened when they tried, and a lot of this is kind of results from the 90s and early knots. And you know what you can see just interpreting this table very quickly. So for a human, since we're not mice, our blood sugars need to be below 120, right? That's, that's the magic number. So you can see here, this patient was 275, that patient was 235. Then they put in the transplant, this patient just barely got below 120. Still pretty high, 115, right? Well, qualifies. This patient never cured, right? So they had to take him off the therapy. About a year later, this patient was high again. So it didn't last. And people were confused why. They didn't understand for a long time. And it took about a decade, but you know, we've kind of seen this sort of problem with other implantable materials, right? So it turns out if you put something into your body that's foreign, your immune system recognizes it as foreign, right? And if it can't get rid of it, if you can't, say, pee it out, if you can't break it up, your body does its last resort, and that is isolation, right? It basically deposits scar tissue all over it. This is everything that goes into your body. So, you know, if, if you ever got like, um, say, uh, you know, a, repl a, a knee implantation, you know, you get an artificial knee or an artificial limb put in you, it ends up getting covered in scar tissue. The question just becomes is whether that scar tissue causes a problem for the function of that implant, right? And you can see here, like on the upper left-hand corner, this is a, an implantable delivery device. So this releases drugs into the bloodstream. And look, all of that kind of white coating on it, that it's almost like an envelope. That's all scar tissue that's been built up on the device, right? Another very important real-world example is this is a pacemaker, right? So you remember how pacemakers work. It sends an electrical signal into your heart tissue so that your heart beats at the right rhythm. This is the very tip of that kind of what's called the pacing lead, what delivers the electrical current. And you know, without having something to combat the immune system response to it, it basically gets all this scar tissue built up around it. And that does affect the function of that device. So that you have to go in there and you need to replace that right, to clean it up. Otherwise, your pacemaker will stop working. So this is called the, the foreign body response. right? It's just a, a more elaborate way of saying the immune system recognizes things that shouldn't be in your body and tries to do something about it by depositing a bunch of scar tissue. Well, you can imagine if you have these kind of little spheres or little microcapsules, however you want to call them, of insulin-producing tissue, uh, when you look into these patients where these tissues, these implants were implanted, this is what you kind of see over here. And just so you see all that white stuff that you kind of see, that's where the beads are, and they're completely covered, encased in this scar tissue. Now, unlike these other implantable materials, right, if what you have on the inside isn't living, maybe you have a chance that it won't affect your function so much, but there's cells on the inside of this. Having a bunch of scar tissue built up on the top causes some really large problems. You know, so you protect the don donor tissue physically from the immune system, but because the material itself, the alginate, is recognized as something foreign, the implants get covered with this scar tissue and that donor tissue will die because it no longer receives oxygen or nutrition, right? It's, it's still a cell, right? It still needs to have these kind of basic elements in order to survive. And then you can kind of see up here on this picture on the right, this is from a non-human primate. So, you know, you can kind of see in a monkey, you can see the similar type of response that kind of happens. So that becomes a little more important later on in the presentation um, as to why that's a meaningful result. But, the question then became, all right, alginate gets us pretty far, nine-tenths of the way there. It all has all these great properties for protecting the donor tissue. Uh, we just need to figure out that one extra one-tenth. You know, how do we make it a little better? Can we make a better alginate? Can we improve alginate so that it's invisible to the immune system, it's, so it's not recognized as foreign and you don't get all this scar tissue buildup around it? And this is where I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining, because I, I think this is, you're going to see this is actually becomes a very general, generalizable technology uh, that can improve a lot of implantation technologies. And how do you think about improving this? Well, you know, we knew alginate gets us there. So, you know, I was a chemist when I started on this project. You know, what if we just made derivatives 
what are called analogs. What if we just decorated the polymer, right? What if we connected little drug-like molecules to the polymer chain so that the immune system sees something slightly different than just the basic structure of the polymer sugar backbone, right? It's kind of a very simple idea. What, you know, kind of thinking like you're, you're changing the paint color on your house, right? The immune system may see your house if it's white, but maybe we paint it a little blue, all of a sudden it's invisible, right, was kind of the idea. Uh, what do we use to, for those, those decorations, right, those compounds that we're gonna attach to, to the alginate? We had no clue, right? We, we literally just didn't have enough information at the time to, to really make meaningful guesses, so we just had to make a lot of stuff. And we made almost 800 different kinds of alginate in order to find an alginate that was invisible to the immune system. And I only put kind of this, this next slide just to show you how hard it was, because <laughs> it wasn't easy, um, you know, from making 800 different types of, of alginates to determining how they are actually invisible or if they're invisible. How do you sift through that? It actually becomes an interesting problem. Uh, but you can see here we had to test things all the way up into, into monkeys right, because we were always worried about, will this be translatable to humans? And unfortunately, in, in today's science, the only way to have some assurance of that is if you have some data in a non-human primate model, right, to give you some confidence that that can transfer. That's why that data I showed you on that previous slide was so important. It showed that that foreign body response was recapitulated in a primate as well as in the human, right? So let's see, so this is in mice. This is the result. I'm just gonna kinda get to the chase, and I'm gonna show you how we were able to filter through all 800. This is naked alginate, so this is alginate that's already been tried and, and clinically, and this is the big reason why it fails. In this experiment, we're basically imaging inside a live mouse. We have placed in these little alginate spheres. They show up in basically pink, purple, right on your screen. And all the little green dots there, those are immune cells. Now this is a video, so it's kind of accelerated, about 40 minutes or so, advanced in 15 seconds or so. Um, what you'll notice is they're all kind of clumped up around the, the, these spheres, right? You see all this kind of aggregation right here. That basically means it knows it, that those spheres shouldn't be there, right? It's recognized it. It's mounting a response against it. These implants aren't gonna make it. They're gonna get covered in scar tissue in the next two weeks, essentially. If we take one of our new alginates, the one of something we discovered from all of that trial and error that we did of the 800 that we made, this is what we ended up discovering. We found an alginate that this is what you see instead. Right? What you instantly see is this alginate, you don't see as many green dots in the space between them. And very satisfyingly, if you can kind of, I'll play that video one more time. Looks like it's running a little slow. But you can kind of see there, some of these little green spots bounce off the surface, right? So it's not that the immune system doesn't know something's there. It knows something's there, but it doesn't know what to do about it, right? It can't mount a response. So this, this strategy we had of decorating the polymer of decorating this material with different comp drug-like compounds has changed the way the immune cells interact with the material, right? exactly as we would have hoped. You know, push that into non-human primates, and you know, in this kind of experiment, this is after we, we put them into the abdomens of these monkeys, and then four weeks later, we tried to retrieve them, right? And, and we looked at the, at the little spheres and see how much scar tissue we have on the surface. So here on the far left, that's naked alginate, and you'll see those spheres are kind of covered with that white brownish stuff. That's, that's the scar tissue. And then right below it is kind of like a more colorful representation. We've kind of done some staining to kind of accentuate the buildup of, of scar tissue on the surface of these beads. And then here are what were our top three of those 800 materials that we had basically screened and scoured through. And what you can see is these spheres are almost pristine, clean, right? This one a little bit less so, but the other two for sure. So we had successfully blocked 
this recognition of this material as being foreign in the body of these monkeys. And even more excitingly, it, we, we let it go out to six months, right? And it's still, you find spheres that are very clean, absent of any scar tissue formation. And here you can see just little, all these, there is a bead in that picture, <laughs> right? It's just, that's how clean it is. If you aren't able to stain for any soot that's built up on it, it basically comes out as being black, like there's nothing there. So does this work, right? Remember, this was coupled with that other major advance of having this unlimited tissue source now, right? So if we combine these two technologies, if you now have a material that's invisible to the immune system and now have these human insulin-producing cells that are virtually unlimited, if you bring these two technologies together, do you have something that's basically a superior implant technology for replacement therapy? And that's what we tried to do. We worked with Doug Melton's lab. We encapsulated his cells. This is kind of what it looked like in one of our lead new alginate materials. And just to set the expectation properly, this is what happens when you do naked alginate and dug cells. And now we've encapsulated them in naked alginate. There's no decoration on these alginates. And we saw how long we could uh, correct the blood glucose levels of these diabetic mice. 200 is the magic number for mice. And you can see only at the highest dose of dug cells, 15 days maybe, it went below 200, right? Not that promising, essentially. We use one of our new alginates. That's, this is what we get. So all three doses now worked. All three doses went below 200. And this is for three months. How about six months? Right? And what's great about this one is we put a healthy mouse in here too. We tracked the healthy mouse for the same amount of time. So a non-diabetic mouse. So we could compare the two. How well are we achieving this correction relative to a non-diabetic animal? And it's, you know, it's not perfect by any means, right? It's, it's not a perfect tech replacement, right? We're not putting in a perfect pancreas, right? There are some differences there, but I think any diabetic will take this. Right? This is superior blood glucose control compared to what they're getting today. Just to show, you know, can it respond to a meal? So I, I told you the artificial pancreas, the closed loop device can't respond well enough to basically an acute spike like a meal consumption. Well, we can kind of simulate a meal consumption in these diabetic mice, and, and this is what we did. Uh, the top is basically the diabetic mouse, the pink curve. So you give them a bolus injection of glucose and you see how fast they're able to bring that blood glucose back down to below 200, to normal levels. So the diabetic mouse does not correct. The healthy mouse corrects in blue, like that, and our implanted mouse is there in green. Again, it's not perfect, but it's close, right? It's pretty close. I show, I've shown this to, to donors at JDRF events, and they look at this and they, they kind of run up to me as, when can I, when can I access this technology? I was like, it doesn't quite work that way, you know. <laughs> this is just mice, right? We still have a little ways to go. That's why I tell you, two decades, right? So now we can take this and, and move it into something that's more clinically relevant, you know, do things like initiate clinical trials with an IND and start to get that data to see if we can put it into people. And if it does last for six months, to me, I think that's, that's a bit of a tipping point. I think a lot of people will take an implant every six months if that's how long it lasts. But we don't know the answer to that question yet. I can't tell you how long these implants last. We've never pushed it all the way to failure because we have to publish papers, <laughs> right? We can't wait years. So six months was already a long time to wait. And just to kind of point out, sometimes you never really know what you're going to get in science. Um, you know, I had this idea, you know, if it really was these decorations on this alginate that was making all the difference, you know, why is there anything special about alginate? Well, why would it be any material, right? And so this is kind of what happens. So over here on the left, that's polystyrene, it's plastic, right? A lot of things you buy, toys, whatever, are made of polystyrene. You put it into the body, it's nasty. Look, all, all of these are little beads of plastic and they're basically all stuck together, right? It's all that scar tissue holding it together. It's actually kind of gross to pull out of the mouse. We coated them with one of our decorations that we had discovered from the alginate experiment, and this is what you get out. 
free-flowing beads. Almost looks like they didn't go in. Right? Almost no scar tissue on the surface of them. You know, use some other materials, you know, PDMS and medical grade silicon. If you go into a hospital today, the tubings they use on you, all that stuff are usually made out of these two materials. So we did the same experiment, right? And this is how they look like uncoated. All of that nasty stuff kind of builds up the scar tissue. It's a really nasty reaction to that material your body mounts. We coated them and they come out very, very, very clean, right? And you can kind of accentuate that with some of the, the staining that I showed earlier. So it, it turns out we discovered something fairly general by having a very focused goal in this diabetes application space, right? So this kind of leads to all sorts of ideas and other types of implantable technologies you could improve, right, just by, by this fundamental discovery of how do you make things invisible to the immune system. So kind of looping back here, so, you know, just pointing out, this was a big tour de force in all of these efforts, right? Uh, the labs that participated in all of these uh, scientific projects, they're funding essentially the base funding, the foundation, the floor comes from NIH, right? That's what allows these labs to be established. And because they were able to make a track record with federal funding, it allowed other organizations like the JDRF, like the Helmsley Charitable Trust, to accentuate, to augment specific projects and experiments with additional funding, right, that allowed these projects to basically take hold. So the, the new materials, the new Alginates project was not just NIH funding, but it was accentuated with JDRF and Helmsley funding, right, which allowed the primate experiments to happen, right, which allowed all these kind of more expensive and com complicated experiments to take place, right, and it allowed for a consortium of scientists to come together. But without the NIH funding, these labs wouldn't have existed, right, to kind of bring the point home how important it is. And then all of these ha are, have some home in the industrial sector, and, and this is kind of a key aspect of translating these technologies, right? So the artificial pancreas, it was an effort from Medtronic working with the JDRF. Uh, the new tissue the derived from human stem cells, that now is in a company called Sema Therapeutics that's trying to translate that to patients. And the new materials that I talked about, the kind of these new decorations and new materials, is now in a new company called Sigilon, trying to find a clinical application for these technologies. This is a key part to the puzzle. This needs to happen in order for to bring that technology from the lab, from the academic environment, to the patients in the clinic. So are we close? kind of coming back and looping back around to the end. Uh, I hope I've proven to you that there's improvements in the way we're going to treat this disease, and only time will tell how long these, these new treatments will be effective, um, and obviously that will require additional research to improve the technologies, extend their duration. You know, do I always think, you know, this is the first technologies of their kind that have been developed? Do we hit a home run the first time around? I would like to think so, but realistically, no. You rarely hit a home run out of the park the first time around. So there needs to be some iteration and improvement to kind of make it even better technology. Uh, and also, you know, you'll notice the reversal part of, of this equation, actually attacking the underlying causes of this disease. We haven't even really been able to address that, right? There have been attempts. They've all failed, right? So actually, autoimmune reversal is one of the greatest challenges for type 1 diabetes moving forward, right? And it's just going to require more effort, more research, more dollars uh, in order to, to really change the script to actually cure the disease and restore complete normal function for, for these patients. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and also, you know, I have to acknowledge it was, this was not just me, <laughs> right? I, I did play a pretty key role in a, a lot of what was talked about. But it was a consortium of, of researchers, colleagues, friends, working really hard around the clock to try to, to bring this science and this technology to light. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.